Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen in Indonesia, and good morning to those in the UK. Thank you so much for your presence in today's online webinar. My name is Amanda, and welcome to the Indonesian Contemporary Art and Design 2021, or ICAT 11's online talk on the invisible, free this space, a look into the Indonesian pavilion at the London Design Biennale 2021 with London Design Biennale and Kemen Parikraf, or the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy in Indonesia. We are glad that ICAT could come back this year in 2021. ICAT 11 is presented by Yayasan Design Art Indonesia. Before we start the talk, ICAT 11 would like to say thank you to our strategic partners, Pemerintah Provinsi DKI Jakarta, Kementerian Pariwisata dan Ekonomi Kreatif, Kementerian Pendidikan, Kebudayaan, Riset dan Teknologi, Artura Insanindo, Grand Kemang Hotel Jakarta, Motion Picture Association. ICAT 11 is also supported by BRI Prioritas, Anka Fortuna Cinema, Designer Shop, Dynamite Asia Lighting, Bioforms, Taco, Malka, Ditton, Samsung, Pete Anika, Interindo, Lestari, M Projects, Institution Partners, Kamar Dagang Indonesia, Koalisi Seni, Asosiasi Galeri Seni Indonesia, Seni Untuk Indonesia, Himpunan Desainer Interior Design Indonesia, University Teknologi Mara, Titik Temu Ikatan Arsitek Indonesia, Himpunan Desainer Mebel Indonesia, Asosiasi Desainer Grafis Indonesia, Aliansi Desainer Produk Industri Indonesia, Design Technology ITB, UNDP Accelerator Lab, Behavior Design Lab Universitas Pembangunan Jaya, Asosiasi Produser Film Indonesia, Aku Cinta Masakan Indonesia, Yayasan Habibi Ainun, Dewan Kesenian Jakarta, Jakarta Biennale, Jakarta International Contemporary Dance Festivals, Kine Forum Jakarta Experience Board Festival, Kolaborasi Jakarta, Komite Ekraf Jakarta, Jakarta Fashion Week, Angkasa Pura Satu, Ganara Art Alika Communications, also our international partners, London Design Benali, of course, Super Studio Milan, Instituto Italiano di Cultura, or EIC, Institut Francais d'Indonésie, Cité du Design, École Supérieure d'Art et Design Saint Etienne, Japan Foundation, Asia Student Package Design Competition, also to our official TV partners, Metro TV, Media Partners, Design Anthology, Casa, Style and Decker, Idea in Clover Magazine, Arkinesia, Arts Asrinesia, BCI Asia, Construction Plus, Majala Semirupa, Harian Kompas, Gatra, Femina, Naras TV, Kompas.com, Media Indonesia, Tempo.co, Jakarta Globe, Berita Satu, Manual, Geometry.id, GreatMind.id, Sugar and Cream, Tanam Tumbu, Mojok.co, Girl Weekend, Altspace.id, Luxina.id, Written.id, GNFI, What's New Indonesia, Indonesia Expat, Now Jakarta, Arsitek Archify, Indo Art Now, Satulinka.com, Art Calls Indonesia, Official Ticketing Partner, Event Event, and Event Journal. Also, our radio partners, Hard Rock FM, Crumbors Radios, and Sonora FM. Before we start the talk, I would like to welcome Mr. Hari Purwanto as the head of Design Art Indonesia to give his welcome note. As Mr. Hari Purwanto will be giving his opening note in Bahasa Indonesia for our Indonesian audience, allow me to translate his note in English. Please welcome Pak Hari. Terima kasih, Mandy. Thank you. Selamat sore untuk waktu di Indonesia dan selamat pagi untuk waktu di London. Good afternoon for those in Indonesia and good morning for those in London. UK. Tentu kami merasa bahagia dan bangga Yayasan Design Plus Art Indonesia melalui program Indonesia Contemporary Art and Design dapat berkolaborasi dengan London Design Biennale. Diskusi ini merupakan rangkaian kegiatan selama pelaksanaan ICAT semenjak tanggal 21 Oktober hingga 28 November mendatang. Certainly, Yayasan Design Art Indonesia is very pleased to collaborate with the London Design Biennale through ICAT's program. This discussion is part of ICAT's ongoing activities, which will run from the 21st of October to the 28th of November 2021. Terima kasih dan apresiasi yang tinggi kami sampaikan kepada London Design Biennale dan Kementerian Pariswata dan Ekonomi Kreatif Republik Indonesia 
atas dukungan dan kerjasamanya yang sangat baik. Our thank you and high appreciation go to London Design Biennale and also Kemen Parikraf, the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy in Indonesia for the wonderful support and teamwork. Ucapan terima kasih juga saya sampaikan kepada para narasumber, Ibu Victoria, Victoria Brooks, Director London Design Biennale, kepada Bapak Joshua Simajuntak. Sebetulnya beliau inilah yang pada awalnya menginisiasi keikutsertaan Pavilion Indonesia di London Design Biennale. Yang berikutnya Dewi Dia serta Kevin Junaidi yang akan ikut menambahkan presentasi pada sore waktu Indonesia dan kepada Mbak Yeni yang juga adalah moderator tapi beliau juga sebagai project manager pada proses seleksi untuk desainer yang hadir pada Pavilion Indonesia di London Design Biennale. So our thank you also goes to our speakers. First of all, Mrs. Victoria Brooks, the director of London Design Biennale, and of course, Mr. Joshua Simanjuntak, as he was the very person who initiated Indonesia's participation in, at the London Design Biennale. And of course, to Ms. Dea Widia, the artist, as well as Mr. Kelvin Junaidi, who will also add his statement during uh, Dea's presentation. And lastly, to Ms. Yeni as the moderator, but also the project manager for the selection process of the Pavilion of Indonesia in LDB 2021. Semoga baik saat ini dan akan datang kolaborasi antara Indonesia Contemporary Art and Design dan London Design Biennale dapat terus terjalin, berkembang dan berdampak positif bagi perkembangan desain di Indonesia. We truly hope that the present and future collaborations between ICAT and LDB could continue to take place, flourish, and give positive effects to the development of the design world in both in Asia and in the UK. Pada akhirnya saya mengucapkan selamat berdiskusi, selamat memberi pencerahan. Terima kasih, salam hangat saya dari Indonesia. Lastly, I would say, I would like to say, have a great and enlightening discussion and our warmest regards from Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Terima kasih, Amanda. Thank you. You're welcome. Very pronto. Uh, now I would like to welcome our moderator, Ms. Suyeni. I'm sure that all of you are in good hands tonight with Ms. Suyeni. So please enjoy, enjoy the discussion. Hello everyone, introduce me, I'm Yeni as the moderator today. It's been an honor for me today to host today's session. A very warm, warm welcome for everyone uh, today. Good afternoon for everyone in Indonesia. And I think good morning uh, for Miss Victoria, who is I think around 9 a.m. in London today. Uh, I will uh, start the session with uh, my very first questions. My very first question goes to Miss Victoria as the director of London Design Biennale. So my first question is, uh, what makes this London Design Biennale is a very special initiative and it's significant to the international design world. And how this uh, event, the London Design Biennale cope up with this pandemic time and what what is any change to this year's editions of this PNLA? And what are your thoughts about the, our Indonesian pavilions to this year and your opinion to collaborate with Indonesia again? Thank you so much, Suani, and, and thank you to Harry and uh, Amanda for your very kind words. Um, good afternoon to you. It is morning indeed. I'm speaking to you from London. Um, I'm Victoria Brokes. I'm director of London Design Biennale. I'm also a senior curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum here. Yeah. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be in, in your company. Um, I'm going to give a little run through of the Biennale. Um, talk a, a bit about the place of international exhibitions historically, uh, and then maybe how I think things might be changing for us in the future. 
Um, now, just to ask, I, I can only see me. Have you got my slides um, on the screen there? Yeah. Lovely, thank you so much. So next slide, please. So to um, introduce myself and the Biennale, this was our graphic identity for London Design Biennale 2021, which took place in June. Uh, it was a tree to represent renewal, rebirth and revival which felt really right for that moment. I think um, like you, um, we opened in fact, two weeks after restrictions had been lifted in, in London. So people had not been to galleries and museums for an awfully long time. Uh, and it was a very exciting moment and a rather nerve wracking moment. Uh, next slide, please. The Design Biennale takes place every two years over the majority of Somerset House, and it presents London as this prestigious global stage for world leading contemporary design and design led innovation, creativity and research. And it's an opportunity for the world's countries, cities and territories to exhibit original and exceptional design installations in response to a theme. Next slide, please. And what I think makes it special is um, that countries can present design from any discipline, from product to architecture, from graphic to digital. It's the first design biennale in a world capital city. Uh, and each edition has a distinct theme to give overall coherence and unity between what are national exhibits. Next slide, please. Uh, this, as you can see on the right, was our centrepiece for this year, um, the UK Pavilion, which was a forest built in the courtyard of Somerset House for Project Everyone, which is an organisation set up to present the United Nations Sustainability Goals. It was designed by uh, designer and artist Ez Devlin, who was also artistic director of the Biennale and has also done the pavilion this year, the British Pavilion at uh, Dubai. Uh, at Expo. Um, when we opened here, as I said, it was just after the pan pandemic and the public poured in to see 36 international pavilions, a collection of universities and art schools who were exhibiting in the field of sustainability and innovation. Uh, and, um, and slightly in response to your question about what changed in the pandemic, we created a special exhibition called Design in an Age of Crisis, which was conceived in the pandemic. But I think we all probably feel that things have changed for us over the last 18 months. Um, and it's interesting to reflect on what that means for the Biennale um, and uh, for organisations and events such as ICAD. Our next exhibition, oh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, so that is the forest in all its glory, that's 400 trees. And next slide, please. Uh, so to take us right back, <laughs> and uh, as I say, I also work at the v &A and our, um, our uh, ancestor is the Great Exhibition of 1851, which is usually considered to be the, the first Great World Expo. Um, it ran for five months and it was attended by six million people and it marked the dawn of a great era of international exhibitions and world fairs. Next slide, please. It was so successful uh, that an entire area of London was created from the profits, including uh, the South Kensington Museum, which is now the V&A, the Royal Albert Hall, the Royal Colleges of Music, of Art, of Organists, and so on. Next slide, please. And a new road network was created and its legacy and success is still a, a feature of today. Um, next slide, please. And uh, this is a sort of modern day uh, blockbuster. This is the David Bowie, an image from the David Bowie exhibition, which I uh, curated and ran from 2013 to 2017, traveling around the world. And it was seen by more than uh, 2 million people. Next, next slide, please. Um, so just generally what I think we're all feeling in the world and in the world of exhibitions, um, and we were aware of this pre-pandemic was the rise of the experience economy. I know this is not something I need to tell you about. I think it's very, very well understood, uh, perhaps more so in, in the East. Uh, but what we find uh, here now, um, and I think more, more or less all over the world, is that people are more interested in doing things and less interested really in buying things. So they want unique um, and multi-sensory entertainment. 
their leisure is very precious to them and they don't necessarily consider a visit to an art fair or a craft fair or to ICAD or to London Design Biennale. They weigh that up when they're looking at all forms of entertainment. Um, and I think that affects us all. So these are just four examples um, from, from the UK that kind of meld into the um, sort of cultural uh, theatre event um, and cultural space. We've got um, Punch Trunk Theatre, Secret Cinema, and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, so how does this connect with us and with museums uh, generally? Um, I, I think because in the past museums have enjoyed a near monopoly of cultural exhibition making, but as exhibitions have moved closer to entertainment um, in subject, in design, in visitor experience and also in success, the business sector is getting interested. And so there are many things that are now entering that, that space that, that we previously sort of had to ourselves. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but uh, we had a year um, and more of living digitally. And I think what, uh, what sets events where you can physically gather together is um, the, the joy really of people uh, coming together. And uh, just run through the, the context for um, the Indonesian, the wonderful Indonesian pavilion at this year's Biennale uh, with some of our exhibits. So if you just want to go through the next uh, 10 slides um, that are country pavilions, you'll just see the sort of thing that we had in the in the exhibition in London. Next slide, please. And just keep going. It's just a snapshot, really, for people to see. There's Chile. Next. Thank you. You just stop there, thank you. Um, so we were utterly thrilled that we had so many um, international pavilions still, uh, despite the pandemic, able to take part. Uh, but it's certainly true that we were not going to have a, a full house. Um, and we initiated this, um, this venture, uh, which was uh, really, um, I don't want to say taking advantage, but really taking the opportunity when people were clearly being enormously creative but from their own homes to go out to the design profession, architecture, professionals of all kinds in the creative area, but also to the general public uh, to ask what would make their world uh, better. And so um, we, did, we did this uh, with design in an age of crisis and we were absolutely amazed that we had uh, nearly 500 um, responses to this. And we found that uh, whereas when we had started the initiative, we were looking for, <clears throat> excuse me, for star ideas. But what really struck, um, struck us when the entries came back were not so much the star ideas, but the fact that design thinking was something that everybody felt strongly about and everybody could get involved in. And so in the end, the exhibition was actually about that, about the quantity of ideas, about how ideas relate to each other, about how ideas build on each other. And I think that is something that both in ICAD and with us at the Biennale, we are, we are very keen to do. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, just some examples, there's, there's the exhibition there. Uh, next slide, please. So to come back to the Biennale in the forest, um, I think there's another question we're all asking ourselves um, about, and that is, is there an irony in having our own blockbuster with exhibits, many dedicated to highlighting the climate crisis and uh, social equality crisis and the challenges facing the world. Uh, and then we have them come to London for all over the world. Next slide, please. And so looking to the future, we're looking for um, ideas that are, um, that amplify positive ideas and so solutions for a more sustainable future. Um, I think the Indonesian pavilion this, this year was clearly absolutely in tune with this as were well, many, many of our pavilions. I think this will become more and more important. It's almost as if there are now big issues in the world. And if one's not focusing on those big issues, one is kind of diverting maybe un unnecessarily. 
Um, in terms of whether we should be, uh, how digital we should be, um, I think, and I'm, I'm sure you're finding there as well, the, the power of people being able to come together and meet and see things in company is immensely powerful. It's immensely human. Uh, and I think it's something that's not going to go away anytime soon. Nonetheless, we probably like you, put our entire talks and panel discussions on online for the first time. And we also became aware that by doing that, we could talk to people who may never come to London, even without a pandemic, they were not going to come. But the conversations that we were having were interesting to a vast audience across the world. So uh, that is one of the benefits, I think. And um, we, are, we are excited to continue to develop that. Next slide, please. So to bring us back to Indonesia, and uh, we are so pleased that Indonesia took part in a Biennale in 2016, and again this year in 2023. This year's project, The Invisible Free the Space by Dea Widya, uh, was fascinating and thought provoking. Um, and uh, it really looked as a semi-digital um, installation as it as it ended up it really looked spectacular in the space and I know there were immense challenges with doing that and we, we talked about whether to go wholly digital um, and how to best best do it uh, but it was it, it came across really really well and I I think in a sense that sort of somewhat hybrid uh, model which we eventually came to uh, was immensely successful I know we're going to hear much more about uh, the pavilion later, so I'm not going to describe it uh, to you now, only um, only to say that we were uh, super pleased to to have it and it was um, utterly, utterly fascinating and it also very strongly represented um, the kind of ideas that we really like in a Biennale where a national issue is made a global issue because it resonates um, across nations and across the world with all of us. So it may be about a particular place and time, but it speaks to all of us because we can understand what is what is being said. Um, to answer the question, uh, would we like uh, in, to work with Indonesia again? I can say um, yes, without fear of contradiction. Uh, of course, absolutely. Uh, I feel that taking part in an event like this is is um, it, it's of huge value to us. Um, and I think it's of huge value to the countries that take part because you go to the heart of international dialogue about design. Um, and it's especially fitting this year with a renewed emphasis on sustainability um, when of course, Indonesia is so famed for uh, its designers and craftspeople and sustainable production methods um, that ha have been used for, for many years. Uh, and of course, as a creative nation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just to finish, um, to say, I think that the more it's possible to see everything online, we find um, that people crave and need the audience experience of viewing art, culture, actually theater, opera, gigs, and so on together. I'm sure you're finding that this week at ICAD. Um, we should, I think, address environmental factors very carefully and really look at that when we're setting up these exhibitions uh, and, of course, at the social issues that we cover. Um, but I nonetheless see a great future for um, design biennales and gatherings because uh, I think they contain some of the essence of what it is to be human. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I look forward to hearing the other panellists and hearing more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Victoria, for for the explanation and for the for the slides. I think it brings back a lot of memory because uh, I think this is the second time we joined the BNLA, and uh, definitely during this pandemic, I think a lot of things has changed, and we cannot wait uh, what the future BNLA will will come, uh, what will become and how every participant in each country will, will respond and resonate to this uh, situation during the next, the next Biennale. So uh, we're going to the next speaker. I think uh, the second questions will go to Pa Joshua as uh, someone who initiated this first Biennale back in 2016. So we want to hear from you Pa Joshua. Uh, we start with the first questions. What inspired you to initiate Indonesia collaboration? 
with London Design Biennale back in 2016. I just must see mute. So good afternoon, Indonesia, and good morning to England. Well, uh, it's uh, five years ago, yeah. So basically, um, I will tell the story about how how it actually uh, mm -hmm. began. Um, in twenty sixteen, it was the first year of the uh, previous Indonesia Agency for Creative Economy effectively working. So at that time, I was uh, working as the uh, deputy for marketing for the agency. So my main task is to bring Indonesian creative works and uh, talents uh, to the global uh, platform. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, design is very particular because um, my, my, myself, my background uh, was design. I was trained as a furniture designer. So the design scene was somehow familiar to me. So, uh, and I monitor uh, for many years all the design events globally. Well, you have uh, uh, Milan, Milano Design Week, Mice on the Objet in Paris, uh, and, and many others. You have uh, tendons in, in the... Uh, uh, in Germany, but um, mostly those were trade events, nothing in the light of promoting uh, culture, uh, thinking of design thinking or uh, approaches in design, uh, something like Venice Art or Architecture Biennale in that level, there, there was none. So um, I still remember, I was in London uh, late, uh, I think 2015, um, and I was at the right time. Uh, I was given an invitation actually by the, the emb Indonesian embassy in London. Uh, they were saying like, oh, there's this uh, invitation for, for a gathering. It's like, um, you know, they were explaining about this, this London Design Biennale. So it just tickled my curiosity. It's like, what was that? Yeah. So I went there. I remember I went to Somerset House. And there was uh, uh, Sir John Sorrell. He explained about uh, what is London Design Biennale. And I think there, there was also another person, I think Ben Evans, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then when I was there, I was surprised, and it took me by surprise that all the uh, attendants, your government representation, so unlike uh, trade events, you will see design companies would like to participate. But here saying like, you know, for all the people from uh, different embassies, uh, embassies from different countries. So it's kind of like strange. So I thought like I immediately know that this is something different, the London Design Biennale, because it's never done before, right? There's no uh, design event in that type, in that level ever in anywhere that I, I, that I knew at that time. So after that, I straight away knew that Indonesia has to be at the London Design Biennale, the first one, because um, I was just thinking like, this could be something monumental, like imagining uh, the first, uh, Venice Art Biennale 120 years ago, you know, the first one ever. So uh, at that day, I decided that, yes, Indonesia has to be at the LDB. So then I went, I went back home and I spoke to, my, uh, to the chairman of the agency and explain about what is a London Design Biennale. And since there was no reference of London Design Biennale before, so it's pretty hard actually to convince everyone that Indonesia has to be at the, uh, at the Biennale and let alone the budget is not small. You know, it's, it's pretty large budget uh, needed for to attend the uh, London Design Biennale. And it was, it was quite of a journey uh, to get 
to finance, especially to finance the London Design Biennale, uh, apart from uh, making the the product. Uh, I mean the the this uh, yes, I mean the the creation, the creation itself, the artwork. Sorry, the artwork itself. It's it's it's, uh, it's pretty challenging uh, to go to the um, the the London Design Biennale. But anyway, uh, we finally there. We believe that we have to be there, and where there is a will, there is a way. So uh, yes, we finally able to attend the first uh, London Design Biennale in 2016. So that's the story behind the first uh, participation in London Design Biennale. Thank you, Pajos, actually, for initiating uh, this uh, project. And it continues uh, to the second time in 2021. And I think a little bit go back to the, the Biennale back in 2016. Can you uh, tell us the experience uh, being there at the, the Biennale? Because I know you were yes. there back in 2016. And this year, because we are coping with the pandemic, the, the, the presentation was held differently. So can you tell a little bit experience when you back in the pavilion back in 2000, 2016? Yes. Well, um, as much as I have, I hate to say this, but uh, this kind of exhibition has to be offline. It's, nothing um, because the beauty of this exhibition is about the experience mm -hmm. and unlike trade shows trade shows you can probably you can you can uh, exchange it with uh, with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with you know with a 3d online and so on and with the purpose of purchasing products but most of the artworks or the design works at this level of exhibitions uh, all about experience, all about understanding, all about getting the messages. Yes. For example, um, exhibitions such as the, the freedom, the freedom um, to, to enjoy the experience, to understand about the, the, the display in 2016, uh, nothing beats standing in front of the, 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 the artwork. You see all this. The, the, the freedom was consist of of uh, of uh, hundreds of these uh, balls made from coconut fibers and it rotates um, perpetually rotates and on the top of it there's a disc floating like levitate and just seeing that is so breath uh, what do you call it breathtaking like is 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 unexplainable. Uh, so that that's 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 about the experience of of being offline. I, again, you know, um, I know that there's a limitation uh, because of this uh, pandemic. But if you are saying that what was the experience is is amazing, the experience being there, and also. Um, what uh, I feel when, when I was there is interaction, interaction with the people who visited the booth. We spoke and, you know, to, to all different kinds of people from professionals in creative industries to, to passersby because Somerset is in a, in a very uh, a central area of London. You will, uh, during the weekend, I think during the weekend, yes, uh, you see families, they come uh, around and to see uh, our booth and we spoke and, and, and also this is, uh, this is a, a good feedback for the, uh, for the artists to, 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 to feel, to understand if the messages uh, uh, came across uh, uh, to the audience and so on. So it's, it's just amazing. Well, I'm hoping that in 2023, uh, Things are changing, and we are able again to attend the London Design Biennale uh, physically. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Fai Joshua. Going to the last questions. Uh, why is it crucial to showcase the Indonesian designers to you and all the artists in international platforms like this? And mm. what? What? How do you foresee this in the future? 
Well, yes. Uh, let's say Indonesia is probably the fifth largest nation with the with the fifth largest population. Nation with the fifth largest population, but yet Indonesia is very rarely heard. You know, uh, especially the creative uh, individuals uh, across. Only just recently, um, Indonesian talents. I don't know. That's because of the uh, the work, the 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 five years work we did before, but uh, but we've seen now uh, more and more Indonesian uh, creative talents uh, abroad uh, across across the creative sectors. Not only design. Uh, let's say. Uh, we have uh, recently we have a Rich Brian, uh, Indonesian young rappers who's now being known globally, uh, Eco Wise, the actor now entering Hollywood uh, like we've never seen before. Uh, you have Joy Alexander, prodigy pianist, um, who's now in the US and touring the world. Um, yes, uh, I think we have plenty to offer, but uh, that's why, sorry, that's why we have to be continuously, continuously uh, showing our talents, showing the, 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 the works, not only in the trade shows, but in the level of, of uh, exhibitions such as uh, London Design uh, Biennale. And the most importantly, although like apologize that uh, we we missed the 2018 though yes but what I'm trying to say is that we have to we have to we have to um, do this uh, uh, constantly like not missing a bit uh, because that's that's how uh, I think the continuous the, the, the continuity of showing works uh, will uh, make Indonesia uh, exposed to the world. Thank you, Pa Joshua. Yeah. Uh, we hope the government uh, can keep continuing and uh, highlighting all the Indonesian yes. designers, for sure. And I think uh, the last session for the last speaker, the artist itself, Badia Widya. Uh, the next question is close for you. And the next questions for, I think we're gonna highlight the, the installation itself today. So uh, your installation work for the Indonesian Pavilion uh, at the London Design Biennale portrays home as a transient space. Why do you pick that thing especially? And how does it relate to yourself on a very personal level? And as well as the, the, the society in Indonesia. And how does your work correspond to the theme of this, this European Biennale, which is resonance? And could you share briefly the process of this project and uh, throughout the realization of the project itself? Oh, thank you, Miss Yeni, for the question. So, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving me a chance to present and a brief view of the pavilion. So before I answer Ms. Yeni's question, I would like to acknowledge other collaborators who involved in the creative process of this pavilion, such uh, Aditya Herlambang as a video editor, Abar Yumi as a video conceptor, and then Mindu Jati as photographer, and Calvin Juniadi as the digital artist, and me, myself, as the designer. So I hope, like other than me uh, and Calvin here, hopefully uh, you all can make it today. So uh, maybe I would like to share the screen with my presentation, please. Okay, wait. Okay, um, maybe you can just go to the next slide. Okay, so in order to answer the first questions, uh, the pavilion is actually about uh, the idea of home as a transient space, which means that in this project, uh, we investigate about the design in everyday life, which emerged from the socio-spatial practice. 
in Indonesia, the idea of formal and informal practice uh, in design is very visible in our public space. So the formal practice refers to the design for building or play template by the designer or an architect. Well, in other hand, there's a contrast. There is an informal design with informal practice that comes from the spontaneous response of our community, especially in the working class level community. And this informal practice is appear side by side with the informal one. Sorry, the informal practice is appear side by side with the formal building, and it has like a, some kind of ephemeral quality. It means that because it merged from the social special practice, so the architecture that they produce, the design that they produce, are basically against the idea of impermanence of architecture. So it's really focused on the very special temporal and other space and the very very flexible space. So. Uh, in during the research, like uh, I found that uh, there is an aspect of special performativity in which architecture are basically in informal design are built from the event rather than constantly defined by the physical attribute. So this support the notion of ephemeral architecture uh, in which architecture is against an idea of impermanence. And um, then we can go to the next slide. So within the project, uh, we choose a study case. The study case here, we choose is a project of public housing. So we want to talk about this because housing is always problematic. In many urban cities, there are a problem with informal settlement, which occupies space in between building or formal residence, and it's really influenced like a whole grand scheme of the master plan of the city. And then many of the informal settlement is usually relocated by the government in public housing. However, there is a problem here when the design of a public housing somehow is differs from their idea of home. And home for the inhabitants who came from the informal settlement in this society is linked to the social interaction and structure. It's not really like an ideal home physical attribute and everything, but uh, there is a notion of home is, is basically based on the interaction of the social order. And in this informal settlement, the practice uh, social relation is made in a very like a horizontal mode of living. And then meanwhile, when they are moved the multi-story public housing, uh, then the, the social relations change because the space relations change. Uh, they used to live in a horizontal mode of life. Now they are changing like they are going upstairs, down and up. And it's, you know, it's just uh, transforming the whole construction of the social order. And then more of all, um, they also create many adaptation on their public housing. And they want to make the new house feels like their old house. That's why the pavilion is actually talk about how the modern building, which is the public housing, is a responded not in the way the design is intended to be. Such, for example, along the corridor in the inhabitants' uh, uh, public housings, uh, they transform it into a communal space, which is analog to the yard in a, their previous front of their house. So. There's like so many adaptation on the special level in the public housing. Okay. And then uh, to answer the second question, uh, how these concepts are related to the theme of resonance is that in Indonesia pavilion, uh, we talk about the inclusive design. The inclusive design asks us to like imagine our future city on how we build infrastructure, infrastructure with care. It means the idea of Quality, accessibility, sustainability are part of on how we design and our design should be rethink. Especially in the fundamental needs such as housing, the inclusive design on this case finds about how this design practices should pay more attention to the disinfested community, a society who has been invisible for our city planning. In this developing country, uh, in the developing country, it is already visible that the idea of design in public space is really dominated by its working class society, in which surprisingly within their informal practice, we can also learn a new design thinking from them. Lastly, in classic design, inclusive design, we acknowledge the architecture and design which always become a product of the social consensus. 
this is not like a rigid practice, but it's a series of negotiation between designer, institution, user, and agricultural context. So we can move to the next slide. So to express all the main subject matters, which is the idea of this ephemeral architecture and special performative performativity in the informal design. Uh, we made a site-specific installation which has an uh, illusory quality. We try to encompass the idea of a boundary by mixing the real space and an imagined space. Then it's the idea wherein the public and private realm are collapsed, and the special boundary are became fluid. So in the work, we have a virtual exhibition, uh, virtual reality, and the site-specific inspiration. So uh, this is uh, in the slide, you can see this is the virtual exhibition that we exhibited in Somerset House last June uh, that we uh, to have a glimpse, you can visit the website. So in the Somerset, we cannot project uh, our digital virtual exhibitions on the space because we are not allowed to go there by the government. <laughs> so our pavilion goes virtual, which is little bit transform our previous concept, which is we want to make a real installation there. Okay, and then, uh, and then we can go to the next slide. And then along the process, uh, we need to build an offline uh, specific installation itself. So now it's exhibited in ICAT, in Grand Kamang Hotel, and then we develop the set specific installation and virtuality into this exhibition. So as you can see, uh, we can go to the next slide. So in the site-specific word that you see here is a wireless installation that it portrays a corridor and unit facade of public housing typical design. The installation sits next to the restaurant transitional area, which is extended to the inner building, followed by the VR installation. So uh, the wire mesh installation is actually located site-specifically on the hotel transitional idea because it's attached to the existing structure of the building. So the installation itself became a parasite of the hotel transitional area. So this parasite articulation is basically like the artistic articulation that is related to the actual practice where many informal designs are occurs in between space, among formal and public space that we can see at business in our everyday life uh, public space design. And then next, uh, we can go to the next slide. And then now uh, there's a virtual reality here. So for the concept of the VR, please, I would like to invite Kelvin to explain. Okay, uh, so in VR, we use the gamification to change the layout of the wire mesh installation in Somerset House in order to augment it, uh, the ephemeral phenomena. This technology also maps the spatial of sound according to the artistic need in the installation. The plan is an open plan, while actually, when the audience move, they are directed to a certain linear path. The circulation becomes linear by moving the panel object element inside the asset to block the way or prevent the audience from going backward. And when the audience move from point to point, some element will move to construct a new layout of space. Conceptually, this relate to the idea of how the space is performative. The audience perform the space by triggering certain element to move while the position change. This become a metaphor for our built environment has an ephemeral quality. The perceived space interlay with the built space, which consistently produces a spatio temporal experience over time. This kind of practice occurs in the real practice of informal design in public space. The typical space has become a significant spatial language in our everyday life design. In this case, it's the public housing. In the VR, a sense of displacement creates a sense of estrangement where the familiar units constantly change their layout as the circulation somehow become directed 
uh, into direction. It refers to a metaphor of public housing that seems to be open, flexible, or become one of solution, indeed, still raise a new problem. Okay, that's all. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Kelvin, for explaining the VR concept. So, yeah. Um, uh, next, I think that's all for my question. Uh, sorry, my answer for the two questions. Maybe we can get Thank back you, to Valia. The end. A very nice uh, installation. I think uh, everyone in Indonesia now can experience uh, the artwork itself at the ICAT. Uh, and I think one more question for Madea. How do you feel about the work being shown in the home country itself and being the part of the Indonesia Contemporary Art and Design ICAT this year? Uh, uh, because before we can only showcase the, the virtual one at the Somerset House. Now I, I think everyone can experience itself uh, in Jakarta itself. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, the Indonesia Pavilion exhibit in ICAT is uh, actually really sweet with a curatorial team for ICAT public. And in this case, I'm so fascinated on how ICAT can bring together the idea of art and design into the public space. And not mentioning it was quite challenging for us to modify the installation work well. You know, I need to intervene some of the place within the hotels and you know contextualize everything within all the installation itself. Um, so uh, I can kind of gives uh, us like wonderful opportunity to express our idea and research, which can be closely related with our Indonesia audience, which familiar to our topics because the phenomena is really you know everyday life topics. Uh, you can witness something that I'm talking about there as an issue everywhere. It's like across Indonesia. So in that case, uh, this exhibition kind of gives uh, important overview on how public engage with the issue of interdisciplinary approach on art and design. I think that's how I conclude my particip participation on ICAT. Thank you. Thank you, Madea. Uh, I think all the questions for the speakers uh, now it's time for the public questions if uh, if there's any questions for the public i think this is we come to the q a questions uh, any questions come in we are welcoming for uh, the q a and if you have any questions to the speakers please welcome LDB ke depan gimana ya? Tadi ada pertanyaan ya. Ini ada pertanyaan itu tema What is the theme for 2023 LDB? Um, yes, thank you for asking that. Um, we have not yet chosen um, our artistic director for 2023, um, so we've not yet announced the, the theme. Um, we'll be doing that, I think, early <clears throat> 2022. However, we are already talking to people about participation um, because, of course, the theme we set broad, uh, general uh, themes uh, so that uh, people can uh, develop their display um, alongside that uh, when it becomes real. 
but in fact, we already have people um, or countries, cities and territories uh, who have uh, taken space for 2023, I'm really pleased to, to say. We're about to launch our um, full report with um, some lovely films actually of the event. Um, so uh, yes, I, I very much hope that um, the theme when it comes would appeal um, and that uh, Indonesia will be, will be taking part. Um, I wonder, actually, if I could just ask um, Dea a, a question. Are the, when we adapted to the digital presence, um, it was obviously, it was a, a very, very big deal. And I know that we, um, we were all very kind of concerned um, about whether Indonesia might not be able to take part at all and how best to do it. And I found the eventual presentation um, very successful. It was obviously much reduced from the original plan, which was totally spectacular. Um, but it really seemed to work well in the space. And I, I wanted to, to ask if uh, Dea, um, what, what, what Dea thought of, of that and others, of course. Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? I mean, my talk about the process of the making this pavilion? Y yes, it was really about adapting it to be more digital. Oh. Uh, than physical and and how uh, successful you thought that was. I'm just saying I thought oh. it was uh, really successful. Oh, okay. Uh, well, actually, um, um, <laughs> I think it's quite successful, but I'm not like a hundred percent satisfied myself because uh, the problem is time. Uh, we we all like the collaborator and the creatives behind me or the collaborator always have like a lot of ideas and want to kind of uh, give the best but the problem is like we always running off of time and when also making the digital content like for example making the virtual exhibition into the virtual reality we only have like a minimum amount of time which is we cannot really explore everything uh, deep, deeply and then we cannot you know really kind of, you know, doing stuff. And also like uh, the installation itself is uh, because it's uh, specific. Um, I need to rethink about how to move that installation from Somerset into the hotel, you know, because in that way, because the specific concept was also changed. Like what you're talking about, about uh, making a public housing on the restaurant transition, like why are you doing it? You know, we, we need to contextualize that and then, also, the VR itself needs to be kind of, you know, as Kelvin say, it has like the element of the gamification when people came and enter, you can interact. And I think uh, even though it's quite successful, but I think we need like, uh, we feel that uh, there is something that we can elaborate and do more about this uh, whole intersections between the digital and uh, specific installations. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> But, and is it the, in, in Jakarta, is it showing in the same way? Uh, in Jakarta, uh, in Jakarta, we didn't exhibit the virtual exhibition that once we ex exhibit on Somerset, but it does have an installation that you, so you can in the space, there is a site specific installations near the pool. And then inside the installation, there is a virtual reality, the Oculus, so people can, Kind of walk around and feel the summer set house and the installations uh, inside the Oculus. So basically, my idea is like to kind of make the displacement of the specific installations itself that they are having a transformation from the summer set into the Mang Hotel. So, so you know, I want to blur the ideas of how we perceive reality, the imagine and the virtual one. And then with the physical one, because it's the idea, the main idea of the performativity on the space, the ephemeral architecture is something that I am recent during these past two years. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you the, next, question, Victoria. the next question is coming for Victoria. I think. Uh, there's this question. Since we learned about how we can use the online platform to showcase uh, an artwork, do you think that post-pandemic things will get back to normal or we will still keep the online aspect of these exhibitions? Um, 
Well, this is obviously the big question. Um, and I think my conclusion is that uh, we will keep the physical aspect of these exhibitions because, um, because people do like to come together and view things together in company and share their reactions to, to art and design and provocative displays and, 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 and so on. And I don't think uh, that will end. However, there were a number of things that we were introduced for the pandemic that um, we wouldn't normally have done, that the public really did enjoy and that we will keep um, regardless of, um, I mean, I think we're all hoping that uh, things are just gonna get better from here and that this is a once in a century um, event, but um, you know, who knows, we don't know. Uh, we found that people did like the one-way system very much um, that we, we put in place. Um, the, and they did like the um, timed tickets that we had. Uh, and of course, you know, it meant that we had a continuous uh, stream of people going through the space uh, rather than what we're more used to, which is, you know, huge crush uh, at weekends and then, you know, relatively quiet weekdays. Uh, I was just thinking, I showed you that image of the David Bowie exhibition. I mean, that was packed in a way that is now impossible to imagine. I mean, you look at, you know, you look at slides of the public interacting with the exhibition where literally, because it was actually a head carried on headphones, you were elbow to elbow with people and you think of it as a different world. Um, I think we probably won't go back to, to that world in a hurry. There'll be, there'll be something. Um, so I think lots of things come, come out of it. Um, I, I said um, in my talk, we put all of our talks program online and I think we will continue to do that, uh, but we will also have a physical aspect. So, I mean, for all of us, I think we're, we're sort of facing up to what this means because it also adds to uh, costs and organization and uh, and so on to do these hybrid things. But it also increases our audience um, and means that we can have a dialogue with, well, rather like I am now. I mean, what a, an amazing thing it is that I'm speaking to you uh, there now and feel that I'm with you in uh, Jakarta in some way. Um, so I think a bit of a mix, but I certainly don't feel that the physical is over because I think it's an essential element of being human. Thank you, Victoria. And the next question is for Pak Joshua. Uh, how do you think we can make the collaboration between the Indonesia and London Design Biennale more attractive and more richer in the future, such as in the next uh, Biennale in 2000, in 2023? Well, it really uh, depends on, uh, on the situation and as well as the... Uh, the, uh, what's the theme and what will be uh, involved uh, within the uh, the scope of the exhibition itself? Of course, we can we can come up with something uh, unusual. I still remember uh, Indonesia when we attended uh, the Fennis Art Biennale. Um, it is the first time ever in the. 119 years at that time that we that there is an exhibition that is connect between the two worlds I mean the two countries sorry not two worlds two countries so we have one exhibition set up in uh, Venice and one exhibition set up in Jakarta and it's all connected so the the people in Jakarta can interact with the people in Venice there's, an, uh, there's something that we, we did um, out of the box. And, and I think the, even the Venice uh, RP and committee was uh, surprised uh, with the idea. I mean, again, uh, uh, once, once we know what's, what's, what's on the plate for the 2023, we can come up with something uh, totally, totally uh, unique. And, and I, I do hope, I agree with, with, with Victoria. Um, we all wish that is a, a physical uh, uh, presence is, is, is the utmost uh, important as the experience. I mean, I, when I was there, I cannot uh, emphasize more how it felt 
uh, 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 physical exhibition, the interaction is irre irre irreplaceable. Just the interaction, the conversation itself with everyone there is just uh, is just uh, is 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 a must for this kind of exhibition, because this is not a trade show. Trade show, you may probably uh, switch to uh, to uh, <clears throat> uh, digital or, or virtual uh, quite easy, but this type of exhibition, uh, you know, is is totally different. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I, I'll wrap up that there will be our last questions for today because we are out of time too. Uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for today's session and we hope to see you again one day in the next uh, Biennale maybe. And I'll get back the session to Mbak Amanda. All right, thank you so much, uh, Smiany, for leading today's discussion. And thank you to all speakers. So Mrs. Victoria Brooks, uh, Mr. Joshua Simanjuntak, uh, Ms. Lea Widia, and Mr. Calvin Junaidi. Uh, also our moderator, Mbak Smiany, uh, and Mr. Hari Purwanto, of course, earlier for the opening note, and all of our audience who have attended the session on the invisible free space a look into the Indonesian Pavilion at the London Design Biennale 2021 with London Design Biennale and Kemen Parikraf, the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy in Indonesia. Today, ICAT 11 public is held physically at Grand Kama Hotel Jakarta until the 28th November 2021. So to everyone who have not had the chance to visit the exhibition, please do follow our online programs too. Have a good evening for every, to everyone. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. Much. You're welcome. Bye. Terima kasih, Bye. Pak Jos dan narasumber yang lain. Dea, Kelvin. Terima kasih, Pak. Pak Yeni, terima kasih. Terima kasih.